is Dr. Craig. Uh, it's great to interview you again. Thank you. Uh, today, uh, I wanted to break up this interview into three parts. Uh, I call them body, soul, and spirit. Uh, we will look at practical advice, tips, and strategies that you use to comprehend and publish scholarship, as well as how you stay sharp as a thinker and construct your mm -hmm. own arguments. Uh, so to begin with the body section, let's talk about your practice. Okay. Dr. Craig, you've mentioned in your previous interviews that you've studied for several hours a night while in high school. Oh. Uh, you've now spent many decades as a scholar studying for umpteen hours a night. The first question is, what strategies for study have you learned that aid your understanding and comprehension mm -hmm. of the difficult and abstract uh, scholarship that you generally study? Shada, I think that the most important single study habit that I learned was taking notes on what I read. And that was gradually acquired. Initially, what I would do is simply read a book and then put it on the shelf. And what I realized was that I'd forgotten virtually everything I'd read. Uh, if you were to ask me, well, what are the contents of the book? What is it about? I could kind of give a general impression, but I wouldn't know any details. And I thought, well, this is just wasting time. So I thought, well, I'll start marking the book as I read. I'll put little brackets or underlining in the book to highlight important points. Well, the problem was after that was done, all I had was a marked up book, the contents of which I could no longer remember. So I thought I've got to start writing down then, maybe the page number. So what I did was I would write down on a piece of paper the page number, wherever there was something significant that was marked. But then when I was done with the book, what I had was a page full of meaningless page numbers. And I thought, this is no help. There's no way to get around it. I've got to actually start taking notes on what I read. And so initially, this meant doing it in longhand, that I would go through the laborious process of taking longhand notes on everything that I read. And then what I could do would be to take those notes, staple them together, and file them into a file that I could then consult when it came time to writing up my study. And that was the way I worked for many years until we got a word processing in a computer. And now what I'm able to do is to cut and paste. If I read an article in electronic format, I can excerpt from the article and paste into a Word document then the things I need to remember. And that has greatly accelerated the process. But that process of taking notes on what you read, and then filing those notes topically is, I think, the most important and essential study habit that a person can acquire. And uh, generally, when you do debates, Dr. Craig, uh, I've never heard one of your opponents say, hey, that's not my position, oh. you know, and, <laughs> and it's, it's so impressive that you hmm. get, and uh, many times in your debates, you you come out so strong with their position. You have so much confidence uh, mm. that that's what they think. And they never say, hey, that's not my my position. So is it this note-taking process that you go through that, that helps you to guarantee that you understand uh, your opponent in the debate? Yes, the key to good debating is preparation. And so in preparation for a debate, I will read all of the publications that my opponent has on that topic, the debate topic. And then we'll sometimes view a few videos that he might have posted uh, of him speaking. So I get a feel for his rhetorical ability and persuasive power. And then on the basis of that reading, I construct briefs for the most important objections that he raises in his written work, and then my answer to those objections. Uh, and then in the course of the debate, when he raises one of these objections, I don't need to think on my feet. I just pull the brief from my file, and I'll say I have two responses to this objection, or three responses to this objection, and I'm ready to go. 
So this kind of preparation is extremely valuable. Now, the other thing that one needs to add to this is that one has an attitude of charity toward one's opponent. You give him the most favorable interpretation of his view rather than an unsympathetic interpretation of his view. If you were to treat your opponent unsympathetically and try to set up straw men or twist his words, then your refutation is less effective. And so it's really important, as you say, to represent your opponent's views fairly and objectively before you respond to them. Okay. And so what is the name of that briefing style that you've mentioned? This is the way that debaters are trained in academic debate. I participated in eight years of high school and intercollegiate debate activities. And for me, debate was simply an intellectual sport. I was no good at athletics, but I could represent our school on the debate team. And so in preparation for these debates, you, you do this kind of research and prepare these sort of responses, and that flowed naturally into my debate activity when it became a ministry subsequent to completing my graduate work in philosophy and theology. And is the, are these briefs uh, written out in terms of the premises of your argument? If I am responding to objections, then the brief will have at the top of the page a statement of the objection by the opponent, and then it will have a multiple point response. Uh, I typically do not respond with just one point, but multiple points, um, so as to really defeat the objection well. Now, there are other kinds of briefs as well, which would be briefs intended to reinforce my positive case, and those would be structured along the lines of the main contentions that I'm defending in my affirmative case. And so, say I'm defending the Kalam cosmological argument, I will have then the premise, whatever begins to exist has a cause, and then I will have evidence, uh, quotations from authorities, and so forth, to back up or reinforce those points. So I call those backup briefs. They're not responses to the opponent's objections, but they're backing up my positive point. So I've got both the backup briefs and then the responses to anticipated objections from the opponent. And the remarkable experience that I've had, quite honestly, in debating is how overprepared I tend to be. Most of the objections that the opponents have raised in their written work never come up in the debate. And so most of the briefs that I've prepared never get pulled. They never get used. And sometimes I'm disappointed in this because I put a lot of effort into it, but they don't raise the issue. And I'm often reminded of the uh, words of Paul's detractors in Corinth, where they said his writings are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. And that description well describes some of the opponents that I've had in these debates. So how do you label these briefs so that you can pull the right one? Ah, yes, I mentioned that they need to be filed topically. So I have a manila folder called the Kalam Cosmological Argument. And then that folder will be subdivided with manila subdividers into everything that begins to exist as a cause. Uh, the universe began to exist, philosophical evidence, another subdivider, uh, scientific confirmation, another subdivider, and then one for the conclusion, uh, therefore the universe has a cause. And that will typically then be on the attributes of the cause. So that's one um, manila folder of briefs on the Kalam argument. I've got a similar folder for the fine-tuning argument, a similar folder for the moral argument, and so forth. So that would be the way in which I file these things and have them ready. If you've ever watched any of the old debates that I've been in, you'll see me toting a briefcase mm -hmm. onto the stage and setting up in front of me on the table this range of manila folders, and that's what those are. Uh, 
In my debates, I always insist that the stage be set up so that we each have a table at which we sit. I, I will never be in a debate where I'm simply standing at a podium or sitting in a chair like this, uh, because I want to have these briefs laid out in front of me so that I can pull them uh, at the appropriate times in the course of the debate. And so that's, that's what those are when you watch these debates. Oh, wow. And you said you, we need to represent the opponent's arguments charitably. Mm. Uh, does that mean constructing a valid argument for the opponent, even if their argument seems appears to be invalid? No, I think that would be correcting his okay. argument rather than interpreting it charitably. I, I think what I mean by charitably is you try to be accurate, you try to be fair, you don't twist it. Uh, but if he is reasoning fallaciously, that deserves to be pointed out. Okay. And so, Dr. Craig, according to your CV, you have several earned degrees, a BA in communications, an MA in philosophy of religion, uh, an MA in church history, both from uh, Trinity mm -hmm. Evangelical Divinity School, uh, a PhD from Birmingham, a, a, a theology, a doctorate of theology from... Uh, Munich. Munich. Yeah, Munich, Munich. and the other is from Birmingham. Okay. That is, it's not Alabama, it's England. Say, say it again. Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah. Birmingham. <laughs> yes. It's the English one. Okay. All right. Uh, so what did you want to do with the, speak, with the uh, communications bachelor's degree? What was your goal? The you? reason that I did that is because of my intercollegiate debate activities, Sean. That was such an all-consuming passion. Mm. And I'm not kidding, I actually spent more time researching the debate topic than I did on my homework oh, wow. for my various classes. And so I thought if I'm going to be so deeply invested in these forensic activities, as they're called, I might as well get credit for it. So I majored in speech and communications because that was what I was so deeply invested in. And then I would use my electives to get biblical languages like Greek and uh, doctrine, theology and philosophy and, and so forth. But my major was actually not in philosophy or theology, it was in speech and communications because of my debate activities. Hmm. That, well, that's interesting, Dr. Craig, because that was speech was my original major. Oh! Yeah, I went, to, I went into my bachelor's degree. I wanted to be a motivational speaker. And I said, well, let me study speech communications. Yeah. And so uh, I ended up leaving that department in, in pursuing uh, philosophy. Wow. Uh, it, and there's a backstory to that, but that's uh, for another time. Well, I think you will find, Sean, that that time spent in studying speech uh, and public speaking will not have been in vain. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, a philosopher who can clearly communicate his ideas in a persuasive manner is far more effective than someone who mumbles through the reading of a prepared <laughs> talk. Uh, so that, that is a good uh, talent and um, training to have under your belt. Okay. Well, Dr. Craig, I've counted 44 academic lectures and over 300 plus professional articles. I counted 343. Gosh. And that's, that is a lot. And I, I haven't heard anyone mention this in uh, one of the, uh, your interviews. And apparently you were 25 years old when you wrote, when you published your first article in 1974, Evangelicals and Evolution, an analysis of the debate between the Creation Research Society and the American Scientific Affiliation. That's right. I was a student at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School when I published my first article. Wow. Some academic professionals never make it into the 20s as far as publications. Mm -hmm. uh, what writing advice could you give to an, an, an aspiring academic who hopes to contribute to the field? Oh, well, if you want to make a scholarly contribution, I would encourage you to find a narrow area of specialization and to go deep into that area. Uh, if you want to just be a generalist, then you can read everywhere and have a, you know, a moderate depth of understanding. But if you really want to make a contribution, 
I think you've got to pick a narrow area and go deep like a well. So unfortunately, one's knowledge will be rather superficial in much of the other fields, but then it'll be like a deep well in that one narrow area. And that's the best um, opportunity, I think, to make a lasting contribution. And that will take a while. I remember it wasn't until I was in my 40s uh, working on God and time, and I, I said to Jan, I think I'm finally at the point where I can actually make a contribution to the field. Uh, and I, I had confidence at that point that I, I was going to do something important. Wow. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you write in a way that improves your chances of getting published? I think it's helpful, Sean, to imitate the style of authors that you respect and whose writings you find clear and helpful. And for me, a model was Frederick Coppleston, the great historian of philosophy who wrote a nine-volume work entitled A History of Philosophy. And Coppleston excelled in the clarity and the fairness of his exposition of different views, even views that he didn't agree with. And so I think imitating the, the style of writing of people that you admire can be a great help in finding your own style. Dr. Greb, you mentioned that a scholar made quite the impression on you when you were younger. Uh, I forget, f forget the name of the uh, professor but you emphasize your admiration of their ability to make subtle distinctions and quickly refute objections to, to arguments. And you were, and I think they had two earned uh, PhDs as well. Oh. And you said, and so your, one of your goals was you wanted to reach this point. Uh, and you're, no, you're quite known for your ability to quickly dissect arguments in your debates. Uh, do you have any daily practices that have helped you to stay sharp in terms of recognizing when someone has conflated ideals or hmm. committed formal or informal fallacies? I think that the scholar you're thinking of was Edward John Carnell, hmm. uh, who wrote in 1948 a book called An Introduction to Christian Apologetics. This was the first apologetics book that I ever read, and it really did change my life in the sense that it set me on that path of being interested in uh, philosophy and in Christian apologetics specifically. In terms of daily practice, I think reading the work of other philosophers who are uh, more skilled uh, than yourself is really good. So reading the work of people like um, Alvin Plantinga, Michael Bergman, um, Jonathan Hawthorne, Dean Zimmerman, and many others uh, is a way of being stretched and helping you to, to stay sharp and to understand the subtle distinctions that they will often make. All right, so let's talk about the uh, soul uh, in philosophy. In our last interview, you pointed out that propositions are just a fictional way for us to talk about the information content of a sentence. Uh, my question is about the nature of information content itself. Hmm. Uh, what do you make of information content? What is information content? Well, I don't think it, that it's a thing that exists in some sort of abstract realm. It, it cl clearly can't be a concrete object. Hmm. So if it does exist, it has to be an abstract object. Hmm. Um, unless it's a divine thought. I suppose you could be a divine conceptualist and think that propositions are thoughts in the divine mind. But I don't see any reason to think that these sorts of things actually exist as mind-independent things. They are rather, I think, what Thomas Aquinas would call uh, things of reason. Um, they are convenient of fictions that we use to talk about truth and the way the world is and so forth. And so um, in talking about the information content of a sentence, I think one is talking about the propositional content. What is the proposition that is expressed by the sentence under discussion? So for example, 
the English sentence, snow is white, is a different sentence than the German sentence, der Schnee ist weiß. They don't have any words in common. Uh, they don't have the same number of words. They're different sentences, but they express the same proposition. That is, say they have the same information content, namely that snow is white. And, and so I would see um, this information content as being the proposition that is expressed by a sentence. And I don't think that propositions are things that actually exist. We're simply talking about what the sentence asserts. And then we want to know, well, is the sentence true or false? Is reality the way the sentence says that it is? Right. And it seems so the, the fact that there is this difference between the sentence, the linguistic uh, uh, component or element, mm -hmm. and the content of the sentence, that seems to make those two things not the same. The linguistic yes, that's uh, right. device and the content. So what my question is about more specifically the content. So what is content if it's different from the linguistic? Uh, well, again, it is the proposition that's expressed by the sentence. Sometimes uh, we might say it's the meaning mm -hmm. of the sentence, perhaps. But all I'm insisting is that this isn't some sort of an object. It's not some kind of a thing mm -hmm. that exists in the way that, say, people and electrons and mm -hmm. quarks exist. It, it's not an actual thing in the world. It's just uh, an entity of, of reason that we use to talk about what the sentence means. Okay. What about a thought? Because a thought is, yeah. would you also say a thought is not a thing? I mean, because when you oh. say it's not a thing, it's, it, it sounds like you're saying it's not real. But it's I know, I know, and, and that's not what I mean. I don't mean to say that this is illusory, but that it's, it doesn't have a kind of positive status in your ontology, your account of what actually exists. Uh, you don't need to add some object to your ontology to have propositions or meaning. Um, and so with regard to thoughts, thoughts might be things, but if they are, they would be concrete things. Maybe they would be uh, events or, or something of that sort in a mind. Maybe they would be mental states, something of that sort. Um, but even then, I'm not sure that we're committed to actually saying that we have to add thoughts to our ontology. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about meaning itself. Maybe meaning is something of the soul, a function of the soul, the soul's ability to, uh, it's pre-programmed, uh, for lack of better words, to when you, when you use a linguistic component for that to uh, cause an effect in my soul, and that, that effect is the meaning that, that, that occurs. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't think of it that way. I don't think they would stand in cause-effect relationships, think of it this way. It seems to me that meaning is just a reification of saying the sentence means blank. And you can reify that or, or thingify it by then talking about the meaning of the sentence. But what you're really talking about is, is a verb. The sentence means that snow is white. Mm -hmm. On this view, what the sentence means, because usually when we say uh, a sentence means X, we can give a different sentence. So our, is meaning uh, uh, derivative or reducible to other sentences? Is that no, I don't saying? think so. The way that philosophers talk about propositions is that propositions, if they exist at all, would be abstract objects which are expressed mm. by sentences, not identical mm -hmm. with sentences. So careful philosophers will often use the locution, what is the proposition expressed mm -hmm. by this sentence? But they wouldn't identify the proposition with the sentence. And so the philosophical use of the word proposition is rather different than when theologians talk about, for example, propositional revelation. Mm -hmm. And there they are thinking about verbal or linguistic mm. revelation in Scripture, that, that Scripture is propositional revelation in the sense that Scripture is a linguistic deposit 
uh, given to us and inspired by God. So that's a rather different use of this highfalutin philosophical notion of an abstract object. Uh, Dr. Ernie Sosa uh, has responded to Plant Dr. Alvin Plantinka's E E A N oh. by saying uh, in a in a lecture uh, that Dr. Plantinka gave Ernie Sosa, there was a panel discussion, and uh, Professor Ernie Sosa was there. Uh, but his objection to the E A N was that it assumed that uh, that R was uh, defeatable. And uh, that that the his, that the cognitive the set of one's cognitive faculties no. as a as a whole could be defeated. And Ernie Sosa wanted to object, and Dr. Plantinga uh, gave the admission. He says, "Well, my argument does assume that R is defeatable." Mm -hmm. uh, what is your what is your uh, what well? Your we need to say something about the background of this okay. for our <laughs> listeners who don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> What you're talking about is Alvin Plantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism. Uh, and it's really an argument against what's called the causal closure of the physical, which most naturalists are committed to. And what that means is that for any physical event, there is always a physical cause which is sufficient for that event. So. In order to causally account for any physical event, you never have to exit the realm of the physical and go to the mental. And so what planning argues is that given the causal closure of the physical and the fact of evolutionary theory, there is no reason to think that our cognitive faculties are reliable. And the reason for that is that the mental content of our beliefs is irrelevant to the survival value of those beliefs. Uh, all that matters is our physical behavior. So if I form a belief that has the mental content, um, that lion is a cuddly, friendly animal, but that my belief causes me to run away then that will, belief will have survival value, even though, in fact, it's false. Um, so the belief content is really irrelevant. Evolution doesn't select for belief content. It simply selects for external behavior. And if that's the case, then Plantinga says, it's highly improbable, given those assumptions of evolutionary theory and um, the causal closure of the physical, that we should have reliable faculties. Uh, and, and that seems to me to be quite correct, that given those assumptions, it is highly improbable that our faculties would be reliable. So this is, I think, a good argument to say that the probability on those two factors that our cognitive faculties are reliable is quite low. Okay. All right, and, and to go to the spirit, uh, I've I've heard many holiness Pentecostal uh, preachers uh, and denominations because that's that's my background. I grew up in a holiness Pentecostal church. Uh -huh. They taught that salvation. But the more I think about it, it seems to be like a dual view of of justification. It seems like they have the forensic view as well as the infusion view ah. because they believe that when, when Christ Christ's death, once you have faith in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Yes. But what that does is that, that cleanses you uh, right. spiritually. Right. So now what you need is you need the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then that's a second, that's a second step. Yeah. Uh, you can be saved, but not have the spirit of God, uh, and that once you receive the Spirit of God, this is the power you get to walk, uh, to be free and separate from sin, to, to live a sinless life. Uh, and that in order for you to go to heaven, you have to stay in this state. You can't sin. I mean, you, yeah. have to, you need to stay, keep the Spirit in you. And if you have the Spirit, you won't sin. They look at 1 John 3 and 9, mm -hmm. he that sin it is of the devil. Uh, th those kind of, what, what is your take on that? Well, you've raised a number of questions there, Sean. 
First and foremost, I think it is important to distinguish between imputation of righteousness and infusion of righteousness, as you put it. And the classical Protestant Reformation view is that justification involves the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us, but not the infusion of Christ's righteousness into us. Uh, imputation is a legal notion. It means that we become legally innocent in God's sight and indeed in virtue of uh, Christ's righteousness, become legally righteous in God's sight. But that new legal status doesn't mean that we suddenly become virtuous, good, loving people. That is a process, as the Pentecostals rightly emphasize, of sanctification that comes through walking in the power of the Holy Spirit over time so that we are gradually transformed into the kind of people that we have been legally declared to be. So there is a clear differentiation, I think, between the legal imputation of righteousness and the infusion of righteousness into us, which is a process of sanctification over time. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about this, uh, this, this view that the, uh, a true Christian doesn't sin? Well, they... I think that it's clear that as Christians, we do stumble and fall along the way. It's uh, two steps forward and one step back sometimes. And so we have the promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And John writes to these Christians that if anyone says he has no sin, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. So as Christians, we do occasionally sin, but the goal of the Christian life is to sin less and less, um, so that by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can actualize God's righteousness as we are conformed to the image of Christ. So I think that until we leave this life and go to be with Christ, we're still always going to be struggling against sin in our existence. And it seems Martin Luther had a uh, a challenge reconciling in his commentary of, of one John reconciling the uh, he that if we say we have no sin you know we deceive ourselves and if we say we have not sin then we we lie and and, and God's yeah. truth is not in us or we make God a lie and then the three and nine one John three and nine it says he that is sin it is of the devil and he cannot sin for his seed that remains in him that seems like an apparent contradiction if yeah. I've ever seen one and. Luther had this wonderful phrase, simul justus et peccator, simultaneously just and yet sinful. Um, and I think that does describe our condition in this life. We are justified legally before God, but in our daily walk, we do struggle against sin. But when John says that the one who is born of God does not sin, I, I'm sure he means does not habitually lead a life of sin uh, against God, he will be experiencing this process of sanctification and transformation uh, in his walk. So I would say, Sean, frankly, that someone who claims to be a Christian but who has absolutely no evidence in a transformed life has no right to assurance of salvation. I, I think a person like that ought to uh, tremble uh, and, and ask, have I really experienced the spiritual rebirth? Because if there is no fruit at all, if, I, if he lives as a non-Christian, I don't think he has any basis for assurance of salvation. And uh, you've spoken about the, uh, the regenerate Christian having the experience of the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Mm -hmm. uh, is, that a, is that a feeling? Like, what is that? Mm. How does that feel? <laughs> well, my understanding is that when a person is regenerated by the Holy Spirit, this is an actual event that happens whereby the Holy Spirit comes into one and regenerates 
or bir uh, births anew that person's spiritual relationship with God. So whereas before the light bulb was burned out, now all of a sudden the light bulb comes on and the person is restored to the spiritual relationship with God that he wants to have. And in contrast to justification, that is not a purely legal notion. That is an actual uh, event that really transpires. Your spirit is born anew to this relationship with God. And so when that happens, it is the inner work of the Holy Spirit whereby the Christian is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And so for Paul in the New Testament, all Christians, even the Corinthian Christians, um, were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But not all Christians are fully yielded to the Holy Spirit. They are not filled with the Holy Spirit. They're not walking in the Holy Spirit. They're often walking in the power of the flesh, uh, and so really, really struggle in the Christian life. Uh, and it's been said that this sort of Christian is actually more miserable and unhappy than a non-Christian because he knows what he ought to be, and he's not, and therefore is filled with guilt and uh, struggle and disappointment. So it really is important as Christians that we fully actualize the work of God's Spirit in our life by walking in the Spirit, which means to be controlled and empowered by the Holy Spirit on a daily basis as we live our lives. And in our last interview, we talked about the Trinity, but we didn't get to the actual verses that that show that uh, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are properly called God. Ah. Uh, do, you, do you happen to know those verses off the top of your I head? I do, I think. Um, the current work that I've been doing for my systematic philosophical theology on the Trinity has especially emphasized certain remarkable passages in the New Testament where Jesus is called God. Now, why these are remarkable is that the word in Greek for God, theos, normally refers to the Father. If you read your New Testament, most of the time when it talks about God, you can tell it's talking about God the Father. Um, but in some remarkable cases, the word God is used to refer to Jesus. And these would include passages like Romans 9, 5, where Paul says that from the Jewish people come, comes the Messiah, who is God overall, blessed forever. Uh, other examples would be Hebrews 1, 8, where the author of Hebrews says, of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then in verse 10, you, Lord, founded the earth in the beginning. So here, both God and Lord are used by the author of Hebrews in addressing the Son and showing his superiority to all created things. And then in Titus 2.13 and 2 Peter 1.3, it uses the expression, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there is a grammatical rule of Greek called Sharp's rule or Sharp's canon, which says when you have a grammatical construction that consists of a definite article plus a common noun plus the conjunction and plus another common noun, then the definite article governs the whole expression, and there is only one referent, not two. So it refers to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you find this grammatical construction both in Titus 2.13 and in um, 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, and then beyond that, you go into the Johannine writings, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 118, one of the most remarkable verses in the New Testament, where um, John says, no one has ever seen God, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. That verse was so troublesome to early copyists 
that they substituted the word son. Uh, the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. But the best Greek manuscripts read the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. And then you jump to John 20, 28, uh, to the confession of Thomas to the risen Christ. Thomas falls on his face and says, my Lord and my God. So he uses, again, both God and Lord of Jesus, and Jesus commends him for his faith. So John 1.1 1, 1 and John 20.28 20, are like the Christological bookends of the Gospel of John, affirming the full deity of Christ. And then one last verse, 1 John, the first epistle of John, chapter 5 and verse 20, says of Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Uh, and so in my work, I go into considerable detail exegeting these verses to show that they refer to Jesus Christ as Theos, and that in doing so, they don't mean some diminished, watered-down kind of deity, but rather the ascription of deity in the same sense that deity is attributed to the Father. Now, that doesn't prove full-blown Unitarianism because you've still got to deal with the Holy Spirit, but these passages are a dagger in the heart of Unitarianism. Any form of Unitarianism which says that God is one person is subverted by these passages which show that the Son as well as the Father, is ascribed full divinity. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Dr. Craig, it's been a, a wonderful uh, time once again. Uh, <laughs> wish we had longer, but uh, this was an amazing interview, and I know uh, everyone watching will benefit from it. And I'll just say, uh, as I usually do on my podcast, uh, thank you, Dr. Craig, and thank you for watching, and I always remember to think better.